Thank you, Dr. Matatsi. As all of you know, I'm Karusha Naip, and I'll be talking about polycystic ovarian syndrome today. So just as an introduction, it's a common disorder, often complicated by chronic and ovulatory infertility and hyperandrogenism. Many women are obese and have a higher prevalence for impaired glucose tolerance. And because of this, obviously, they also form a group with a higher incidence of hypertension, dyslipidemia, visceral obesity, and hyperinsulinemia. It is one of the most common endocrine disorders diagnosed in women of reproductive age as with a prevalence of 5 to 12 percent. This obviously differs according to ethnic background, with South Asian being the highest. Just a few facts, only 5 to 10 percent of women have PCOS, majority of whom will have asutism, be obese or overweight and have insulin resistance. But only 50 percent of women with PCOS are diagnosed. Sorry. A summary of the endocrine abnormalities. They have abnormal gonadotropin releasing hormone secretion leading to abnormal pituitary function. They have disturbed ovarian steroidogenesis with increased androgen production, and this is because of the increased stromal volume that they have. They have abnormal folliculogenesis, which leads to anovulation and unopposed estrogen production increased peripheral conversion of androgen precursors to testosterone or estrogens, and this is worsened by the obesity. And insulin resistance itself is causal in the abnormal steroidogenesis. This is a little pathway to explain the pathophysiology um, leading to the androgen excess in PCOS. The hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance leads to in, uh, LH amplitude pulses from the pituitary which increases your androstenedione and testosterone levels. And also, you get an increase in the DHEA from the adrenal. So for diagnosis, there are three main bodies that um, guide us in diagnosing the um, condition. But the RCOG recommends that we use the Rotterdam consensus criteria for diagnosing PCOS. The criteria is made up of three, um, there's three criteria and you need to have two of them confirmed to be diagnosed with PCOS. Either oligo or anovulation. You need to have biochemical or clinical signs of hyperandrogenism. So the biochemical will be your testosterone or androstenedione levels that are increased and clinical will be your acne, asutism or acanthosis nigricans. And polycystic ovaries with 12 or more follicles or an ovarian volume of 10 um, cc's or more. So a normal ovary, you'll have the, your primordial follicle which goes through a series of maturation events and eventually you get ovulation. But with polycystic ovaries, the follicle development stops and then there are multiple immature follicles which form the cystic component of the ovary. On ultrasound, this is the appearance that you'll see on the ultrasound of the polycystic ovaries. With regards to the suitism, um, it's not just enough to actually see a woman with a hairy top lip and say that she's got a suitism. They need to be graded um, according to the Federman Galway grading of a suitism. And the grading of eight or more is seen as an abnormal in the general population. Obviously, this is also dependent on your, um, uh, sorry, where you're from, the population that you're studying, because the Mediterranean populations tend to have more um, male pattern hair distribution as in, in the normal pop female population. Um, with regards to the PCOS symptoms, as previously said, they have trouble conceiving, they have excessive body or hair growth. Mood changes, as Dr. Matsing has said, um, weight changes, underdevelopment of the follicles, they have a low sex drive, they are fatigued, um, insulin resistant, they have male pattern balding sometimes, and also they have irregular periods. So with regards to investigation, polycystic ovary ovarian syndrome is a multidisciplinary disease and it is changes over the um, of the course of a woman's life. So your focus of your management and your investigations needs to be tailored according to the age of presentation of your woman. In the reproductive years, it will be more the menstrual disorders, the 
contraceptive issues, sexual health, infertility, and hirsutism. When in the older years, it's more the metabolic disease that's the focus with the complications of pregnancy, the cardiovascular risk factors that become more important. And we need to have a multidisciplinary approach with involvement of our allied health professionals in the management of these patients. With regards to blood investigations, they need to get testosterone levels, six hormone binding globulin, um, FSH and LH. AMH has been shown not on its own, but in together with other investigations, a high AMH level can be suggestive of polycystic ovary syndrome. Prolactin and thyroid functions, ultrasound scan, um, cortisol levels, and our, we need to do glucose profiles for them. And then as part of a fertility workup, also the semen analysis and tubal patency assessment as these patients do have fertility issues. Management will be tailored at the underlying problem. So why the patient is presenting to us. If it's a menstrual disturbance, we can consider cyclical progestogens or combined oral contraceptive. If they are fertility is the issue and they are anovulatory, then we will be looking more towards um, ovulation induction. And we need to be aware of the fact that these particular patients are very sensitive and may become, um, and may hyperstimulate. And with, if hyperandrogenism is their main complaint, then we need to look at the anti-androgens, which I'll talk about more about each of these now. So first, firstly, the, the, with the main thing that we need to start off with is lifestyle modification. If, especially if fertility is their aim, pregnancies at 18 months were were double that in patients that have lost weight as compared to patients that have not lost weight. So despite our patients being very reluctant at this idea, it is still, there are less miscarriages, there are more spontaneous pregnancies, and there are more pregnancies at 18 months with weight loss of at least 5%. 5 to 10% of weight reduction can achieve 30% reduction in visceral fat. It improves your metabolic and endocrine profile significantly, and it improves your reproductive outcomes. Ovulation induction, the options that we have at the moment are clomiphene citrate, aromatase inhibitors, and our gonadotropins or GnRH analogs. So this flowchart just, um, if we, like I said, if we, there is no fertility desires, it's weight loss and exercise, and then contraceptive advice. If they are desiring fertility, still starting off with weight loss and exercise, <laughs> then if they are ovulatory, we can use clomiphene or letrozole, Together with metformin, the new guidelines have shown metformin to be the actual, the biggest contributor in um, improvement of management of these patients. And then the surgical options like laparoscopic ovarian drilling, and then lastly, IVF. Polycystic ovarian syndrome can only be diagnosed when other etiologies of irregular cycles have been excluded, such as thyroid disease, acromegaly, and hypoprolactinemia. That's why part of our workup includes the thyroid functions and the prolactin levels. Expert groups suggest that initial measurement of testosterone concentration in women who present with, a surges, with hirsutism, if there are concerns about possible androgen secreting tumor causing the hyperandrogenism, so if they have an onset of hirsutism at a late age with a rapid progression or signs of virilization such as a deepening voice or clitoromegaly, then your thinking will be more towards an androgen secreting tumor and work, out, work them up accordingly. They also suggest measuring DEHEAS as well as total testosterone to look for adrenal sources. So just a summary, lifestyle changes, ovulation induction, metformin and any other insulin sensitizing drugs, then laparoscopic ovarian surgery, and finally IVF. With regards to the hyperandrogenism treatment, if it's a non-tumorous etiology, it's a functional hyperandrogenism such as PCOS. We can give them cipriterin acetate, so your um, Diane type of um, oral contraceptive pills, um, or spironolactone, or flutamide, and like I said, metformin, which is an insulin sensitizer. Local therapies such as um, waxing or laser therapy for the hair removal, um, diet and exercise, and then the other management all for, for the other causes of hyperandrogenism, which are not 
our focus. If there's no fertility desire, the 2018 Endocrine Society Clinical Practice Guidelines on Asutism suggested first line for Asutism and endometrial protection to be the oral contraceptive, the combined oral contraceptive pill. They pro provide a number of benefits in women with uh, PCOS, including daily exposure to progestin, which antagonizes the endometrial pro proliferative effect of estrogen, contraception in those not pursuing pregnancy, as women with oligomenorrhea ovulate intermittently and then an unwanted pregnancy may occur. And also they have cutaneous benefits for hyperandrogenic manifestations. Combined oral contraceptives affect insulin sensitivity, carbohydrate met metabolism, and lipid met metabolism. The effects depend on the estrogen dose and androgenicity of the progestin. Alternative therapies for endometrial protection are intermittent or continuous progestin te therapy or progestin releasing into uterine device such as Mirena. Metformin is a potential alternative to restore menstrual cycle. Cycles as it restores ovulatory menses in approximately 30 to 50 percent of women with PCOS. So, metformin seems to be a miracle drug <laughs> in PCOS as it helps with your androgen, it helps with your insulin resistance, it even helps with ovulation induction and restoring of, cycle, of your um, menstrual cycles. So, just some examples of our um, anti androgen containing oral contraceptive pills. But we must also be aware of the increased risk of venous thromboembolism with these compared to the um, progestin only options. After six months of trial of the, of the combined oral contraceptive as a monotherapy for hyperandrogenic symptoms, we need to add spironolactone 50 to 100 milligrams twice daily. Other available antiandrogens is finasteride or dutasteride which inhibits 5-alpha reductase. These drugs should never be used in women who are not using reliable contraception as there is a substantial risk of preventing the development of normal male external genitalia during early pregnancy. Cyproterone acetate is a steroid androgen receptor blocker and flutamide is a non-steroidal androgen receptor blocker. Gonadotropin releasing hormone and agonists are also sometimes used to suppress ovarian androgen production but they need add back estrogen progestin therapy to avoid bone loss and estrogen deficiency symptoms. This becomes very complex and um, expensive. Long-term consequences. Gestational diabetes is twice as high, therefore all women with PCOS need to be screened for gestational diabetes from 20 to 28 weeks, 24 to 28 weeks. Insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes are also much higher. 65 to 80 percent of women with PCOS, independent of their weight, have insulin resistance. Increased risk of cardiovascular disease, increased risk of depression related to their weight, and increased risk of endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma is 2.8 fold higher. Strategies for risk reduction, according to the RCOG Green Top Guidelines. Exercise and weight control, reduction of as little as 5% has shown to reduce insulin resistance and reduce testosterone levels, um, glucose tolerance tests and lipid profiles with dietary modifications and or medication. There's evidence for the use of metformin without type 2 diabetes, which is beneficial to reduce the short-term effects of insulin resistance and it reduces the cardiovascular risk. Also, it decreases the androgen levels by 11%. And it has a role, as previously said, in ovulation induction. Ovarian electrocautery for selected and ovulatory patients with normal BMIs, ovulatory induction, ovulation induction and normalization of androgens and sex hormone binding globulin. But it may adversely affect your fertility in the future. Bariatric surgery is recommended for the morbidly obese and treatment with gestogens to induce withdrawal bleeds every three to four months. Mental health is a area that we norm, we tend to forget about in these patients. The data demonstrated that scores of depression, interpersonal sensitivity and obsessive compulsive disorder with hostility symptoms in PCOS infertile patients were higher than in those that are <coughs> non-PCOS infertile patients. So PCOS by itself was a risk factor for these mental disturbances. When they compared the infertility patients, when they compared the obese patients and when they compared the patients with acne, all of, 
the patients that had PCOS were shown to have higher levels of mental health disorders. So expert societies suggest that we screen all PCOS women for at least for depression and anxiety. And this is the recommended quick questionnaires. There's a, a depression questionnaire. There's a few quick questions that you can screen them and decide if they need to be referred for further mental health um, assistance. And this is another um, quick questionnaire that's available on UpToDate for the screening for the PCOS women for um, anxiety disorders. And lastly, um, as Dr. Matsasang said, there was an, the um, international um, <coughs> research excellence in PCOS society has brought out new guidelines last year for the recommendation of um, management and assessment of PCOS, where they show us all the guidelines that are available at present and the strength of the evidence. Most of the, ev most of the guidelines do not have very strong evidence and are more guided by our clinical practice, but um, it's a nice summary to read through um, what updates there are regarding the current practice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karisha, uh, for a wonderful presentation. And um, I want to draw the first blood. I'll open it to the floor, and we're happy to take comments and questions for Karisha. Thank you, Karisha. Um, I just want to make sure that I think the, the diagnostic criteria has changed from 12 to 20 mm. follicles. Not because, as I understand, it's not because um, um, it was wrong in the first place, it's because ultrasound technologies have actually improved and they've been sort of over diagnosed. And as far as I understand, there's also an age below which you can't actually diagnose it because. So in summary, what, what uh, Lizard is tapping into is controversies in PCOS. Yes, so there's always controversies around diagnostic criteria, controversies around with what age, particularly adolescents. Mm -hmm. Can you actually diagnose PCOS in adolescents? Do you have any comments on those? For you. No, I, I, I did. I've heard about the change in the diagnosis, but I couldn't actually find it in the article on the recommendation. So I wasn't sure if I should mention it if it had been officially changed yet or if it's still being thought about. To answer your question, it hasn't changed. But you have the, the, the minds that have just read. And, uh, Dr. Sharif, your comment? Uh, I think it's uh, according to the phenotypes of uh, people's. Uh, uh, according to the um, recommendation of uh, published by uh, in Monash, uh, they uh, said that in adolescence it's not uh, uh, mandatory. Uh, ultrasound is not uh, mandatory, in, uh, especially in adolescence uh, uh, patients. So we can uh, diagnose because uh, depend upon uh, the uh, oligo uh, uh, and ovulation. Uh, uh, I've Anyone wants to agree, disagree, and challenge the tertiary? Oh, but can you just expand on that? Because I've just written an article this week that talked about teenagers as one group and adolescents as another group, as if they are two separate groups. What does your group mean by adolescents in terms of age range? In this particularly topic, they, they didn't differentiate pretty much. When they look at the diagnostic consensus, they didn't pay attention to whether you're teenage, preteen, or adolescent. So they just group everyone as adolescent, unfortunately. But th that question is very important. And uh, uh, is there any comment before I open? The no, no, it's just, I think that you seem to quite a disagree with I think the issue is for patients younger than two years to make that the main problem is that on their own, they already have a increased number of policies. So if you do your scan uh, in those type of patients, either way they will have increased number of policies, which would be 
now ending up with a more diagnosis if you're going to put the same diagnosis, in, I mean the same number of qualifiers in the diagnostic criteria. Hence, for the adolescents, if, if you have those two other 